to this episode of Season 4 of the Australian Naval History podcast series, where we examine an event or aspect of the Royal Australian Navy's history. The series is produced by the Naval Studies Group at the University of New South Wales at the Australian Defence Force Academy in Canberra. The Naval Studies Group is supported in this series by the Royal Australian Navy, the Australian Naval Institute, the Naval Historical Society of Australia and the Submarine Institute of Australia. Hello, I am Peter Jones, a retired Vice Admiral and now a member of the Naval Studies Group. This is the second of three episodes in which we discuss the deeds of an elite part of the Royal Australian Navy, namely its mine clearance divers. During this episode, we will discuss their operations in confrontation in the Southwest Pacific and finally in the Vietnam War. To discuss this topic, I'm joined by three retired mine clearance divers and mine warfare specialists. They are Commodore Heck Donahue, who co-authored United and Indaunted, The First 100 Years, A History of Diving in the Royal Australian Navy from 1911 to 2011. And most recently, he co-authored the book, Australian Minesweepers at War. Also joined by Commander Jake Linton, who co-authored with Heck, United and Undaunted. Jake Linton also commanded a clearance diving team in the Vietnam War. And finally, Lieutenant Commander Doug Moore, who, as we'll hear, took part in a range of operations during this period. And Doug was awarded the George Medal for his bravery during the HMAS Melbourne Voyager collusion. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, Jake Linton, in a previous episode, we've uh, described um, the REN in confrontation, but we did not cover the role of the REN divers. Can you outline what they did during uh, confrontation? Uh, certainly, but uh, just, just before I do, I'd like to add that prior to uh, the ship's diver, the shallow water diver did exist, but very, very, very few records or history has been maintained. He uh, was in service in the RAN for a number of years and used the Salvus oxygen breathing apparatus and was trained to dive to 33 feet. We shouldn't forget him. But Confrontasi, the Indonesian-Malaysian confrontation, it was fought from 62 to 66. And the conflict ranged for more than two years along the borders between the two countries from Sabatic Island off the east coast to Sabah of Sabah to Patang in the Malacca Straits, from Tanjong Datu at the western extremity of Sarawak to the Indian Ocean. This border was delineated on the sea. From day one, it was the ships and men of the RAN who were in the front line. Naval commitments included the destroyers and frigates assigned to the Far East Strategic Reserve, visits by a carrier HMAS Melbourne and HMAS Sydney on trooping voyages, but the major patrol and surveillance load fell on the small ships of the 16th minesweeping squadron. The comparative ease with which Indonesian infiltrators could potentially enter Singapore across the narrow Singapore Strait from the Indonesian Riau archipelago, together with the existence of active anti-British and anti-Malaysian elements in the city, meant that the threat of attack on ships in the naval base and those moored in Johor Strait were commensurately high. While the landward approaches were secured and the water boundaries patrolled, assault by underwater swimmer was always possible. Under these circumstances, Commonwealth ships took precautionary measures. Operation Awkward, seabed sewers, ships bottom searches, and the RAN deployed for the first time its a mobile clearance diving team to Singapore. Generally, there was at least one clearance diver on board each of the major fleet units employed to Southeast Asia during the period. While the ship divers could undertake ship's bottom searches, the CD was there to deal with anything found and provide experienced diving support. The RAN MCDT embarked in HMAS Melbourne in February 1965 to join with the RN's Far East diving team to assist in providing a ready reaction diving capability 
which might be required from RN or RAN units operating in the region. There was, however, a more serious incident in the frigate HMAS Yarra on the night of 4 June 1965. Whilst berthed in the stores basin at the naval base, it was described as the extraordinary affair of the missing diver in the frigate's report of proceedings for that month. Yarra had closed up in a modified awkward state three at 1800 in accordance with the current practice and around 2100, the after century sighted bubbles aft. At 2115, the forward century saw bubbles abreast the bridge. Grenades and scare charges were dropped and each of the forward and after areas and the bubble ceased. The ship went to the highest state of watertight integrity and ship's divers conducted a bottom search, but nothing was found. The next morning, the ship's divers conducted a follow-up bottom search and on completion, two of the ship's divers were instructed to carry out a sweep of the seabed under the ship. At 7.20, they surfaced and reported sighting the body of a diver dressed conventionally in a diving suit, face mask and underwater breathing apparatus. The body was resting on the bottom in a crouched over position. No sign of life was evident. One of the divers later said he thought there might have been a large explosive charge in the vicinity of the body. The ship then prepared to move with the aid of a tug. Some 20 minutes later, the divers re-entered the water in an effort to relocate the body, but the tug closed the ship, stirring up the water, and nothing was found. The Royal Navy's Far East Fleet Clearance Diving Team then took over the task. Despite three hours of searching, they encountered nothing unusual. Meanwhile, both of the divers who had seen the body were closely questioned by the ship's diving officer to confirm their initial report. The observations of the body over 90 sections from about a metre away included a full description of the foreign diver's dress and equipment. When asked if they were certain they saw a dead human with diving gear on, one responded, one responded, I am sure I saw a person with diving gear on. Whether he was lying doggo or dead, I'm not certain, but it was definitely a human being. I came to the conclusion, conclusion that he was dead because there was absolutely no movement and no bubbles. Yarra, in his signal report immediately after the incident, concluded that after intensive investigation of my divers, I consider they sighted the diver beneath Yarra, and that diver was not of friendly origin. Following the review of Yarra's report on the incident in Navy office, Commander Batterham, the RAN's diving expert, concluded that there was little doubt that the body of a diver was indeed sighted and in position in addition to the description of the equipment the body in a sitting position fits with the still unexplained phenomena that in most underwater depths the corpse assumes this rather lifelike attitude intelligence advice issued in october 64 included the warning it is known that an underwater sabotage problem threat exists and that the Indonesians may demonstrate their capabilities shortly. Thereafter, the threat of underwater attack was considered to be real and preventative measures were taken seriously. From all the evidence available and particularly the statements from the divers, it would appear that there had been a diver under Yarra that evening, but in the absence of a body, the identity could not be established. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Um, Doug Moore, you were officer in charge of Clearance Diving Team 1 during its first deployment to Papua New Guinea in 1967. Could you outline the issues you faced leading a continuous Clearance Diving Team deployment to the Pacific Islands? Yes, quite happily. Um, first off, we should have a little bit of history. Now, at the end of World War II, all the troops in PNG and Papua New Guinea were told that they could not return to their home countries until the majority of unused ordnance was removed. 
Now, they had suffered years of jungle warfare in hot tropical climate. The war had ended and their only thoughts were to return home. All ordnance that could be loaded onto boats, slant trucks was, and where possible, dumped at sea. Out of sight, out of mind. Along come sports divers and, and trawlers and suddenly all was revealed. The subject of, of PNG deployments is dear to my heart. I was not the first to do a deployment. I was not really the first to PNG. I gather that Lieutenant Alex Donnell was the first to take a small team to Manus, and I believe that most of their work was centred on that island. Lieutenant, Lieutenant Ross Blue took the next team for a three-month visit and expanded their field of operation, and during that period established a routine whereby the CD, permanent, the clearance diver, permanently posted to Manus for duties as the quarryman and resident unwar exploded bomb expert would, in nine months before the clearance diving team returned, survey all requests from the PNG government for assistance in the total PNG area. And from his survey, a full aid to civil power and bomb mine disposal program would be approved. It is hard to explain what the situation in PNG was like. No matter where you went, there was always someone, normally a young boy, who would approach the team and say, you better look him bomb. On the reply of yes, he would lead you down a track and there would inevitably be a bomb dump overgrown with vines or a pile of shells in gardens. In my last month's reports, I stated that we, the RAN, should keep up the yearly deployment to PNG. I feel it fell on deaf ears. The, the team's biggest problems were getting all necessary equipment pre-positioned for each task. The RWF were always called in to provide a C-130 with large, for large moves or we were use a water lighter, aptly named Gunga Din, to move our large high explosives from place to place. Our large explosives took the form of obsolete ship's mortar bombs, depth charges, and were very effective in establishing channels for boats as is aid to civil power. We did quite a bit of this work. The team was always very fortunate to have a CD Oh, on the fo on FOCAS staff, on the fleet commander staff, who was our immediate contact with fleet headquarters and a quick signal to the fleet headquarters always got us the response that we required. Thank you. So um, just as a follow on, Doug, can you describe how the clearance diving teams evolved to manage such deployments? Well, it started off with the with um, the first the first um, the first team to go was uh, with Alec Donald, um, and I'm sure they only went for a very short period of time. Um, and then uh, Ross Blue he took up uh, a team of twelve, the same as me, and then I took twelve. Now we um, we would have. Um, a 12-man team with two CDOs and 10 CDs. This number was bolstered when Fort Prudent with a sick berth attendant and a wireless operator. We would take engineers or would take from the shore depots as necessary to operate any of the large equipment and the Gunga Din. And these extras were not divers. And when the team took over a vessel for an operation, they repaid part of the crew. When the team took over a vessel, they were billeted at the shore with the crew acting as shore keepers. Okay, thanks, Doug. So I'd just like now to turn on to Vietnam. So, Heck Donahue, <coughs> can you just outline the policy decision to send a clearance diving team to Vietnam? Yes, yeah, certainly. Clearance Diving Team 1 deployed to Southeast Asia in the first uh, half of 1966. And uh, following discussions with the commander, assistant, uh, the chief of staff to the commander, US. Naval Forces Vietnam. The team deployed briefly to Nha Bay, south of Saigon, 
where they integrated with a United States Navy EOD team stationed there. Uh, there'd been a mining incident against a merchant ship and the US did not have the resources available to manage such a threat. And Team 1 contributed to countering the mine threat as well as a number of other tasks. Cuthbert, the OIC of the team, reported in June 1966 of the value of such operational service and pointed out that the provisions of a clearance diving team to Vietnam would be a worthwhile commitment achieved with a small outlay. He was fully supported by the then fleet commander, Rear Admiral Vat Smith. However, CDT-1 commitments meant the team was not available for such a deployment. The Team-1 recommendation, however, came at an opportune time as the Chief of Naval Staff, Vice Admiral Sir Alan McNichol, aware that confrontation with Indonesia was running down, was keen that the RAN should participate in Vietnam. His initial thought was to send the minesweepers from Singapore, which, although experienced in anti-filtration anti operations, basing and maintenance would be a serious problem. Whilst Navy prepared its case, government was focused only on the forthcoming election, which they won in November with a large majority. Immediately, Prime Minister Holt directed Defence to reconsider an increased force contribution to the war in Vietnam. The provision of a DDG fully compatible with the US Navy support system was straightforward. Minesweepers were rejected, but the provision of a small clearance diving team comprising just six men was realistic. The US had made it clear that assistance in this form would be most welcome and was quickly endorsed within defence, giving the significant training dividend of such a deployment and the fact that a capability was immediately available. The decision to send clearance divers to Vietnam was welcomed by the US at the highest level, as evidenced from a secret White House memorandum from Walt Rusto, who was the Special Assistant for National Security Affairs. He wrote to Lyndon Johnson, Mr. President, good news. The Australians have decided to send 500 more men to Vietnam, plus a fighter squadron of eight fighter bombers, plus a ship, plus six frogmen that Westie wants for harbour clearance. It's being held very tight because they must detach with some of them from Malaysia and have not yet talked to the British. Clearance Diving Team 3 was quickly formed and by late 1966 had commenced training for service in Vietnam. Following both governments' endorsement to the RN involvement, an Australian defence team went to Saigon in early January 1967 to negotiate the detailed military working arrangements with Commander-in-Chief Pacific's fleet staff. These were quickly agreed and ultimately signed on the 12th of April by the RN Chief of Naval Staff, McNichol, and the Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet, Admiral Johnson. CDT-3 deployed in advance of the formal agreement in February 1967. Team 3 was placed under the overall command and administrative co control of the Commander Australian Forces Vietnam, while operational control for the team was vested in the Commander US Military Assistant Command Vietnam, exercised through ComNav4V. Coastal and riverine shipping were a prime target for the North of Vietnam and Viet Cong forces and control of the inland waterways, especially the Mekong Delta, was strongly contested. CDT-3 would come under the command of Task Force 115, the Coastal Surveillance Force, known as Operational Market Time, through Task Group, group 115.9, the Harbour Defence Group. The team was allocated to the Harbour Defence Unit in Vung Tau, which is one of five up the east coast, containing the harbour entrance control post, a harbour patrol element and an EOD team. The function of the EOT team, which was designated Operation Stable Door, was to conduct daily inspection of ships at anchor and disarm any ordnance encountered. Thanks, Heck. Um, Jake Linden, the RN rotated uh, eight diving contingents to Vietnam. Can you give an overview of what they achieved? Uh, certainly. The first contingent, uh, who incidentally went to war in white uniforms, 
was initially employed in Saigon with the USN EOD team to settle in and undergo local indoctrination courses. At the end of February, they deployed the Bung Chow and moved into one of the bunkers of the Harper Entry Control Point. These had been built by the French many years earlier and although bare were solid, the CDT-3 bunker, or cave as it was known, was progressively developed over the years and became famous for its luxurious accommodations and appointments. When not employed in their primary task of stable door operations, the team undertook many tasks in Phuc Thuy province, clearing booby traps, disposing of damaged ordnance at Vung Tau Airfield and the local military bases, providing demolition support and diving to recover weapons, equipment, downed aircraft and on occasion human casualties. In October 1967, CD Team 3 was fully integrated into the USN EOD Mobile Unit Pacific Organization in South Vietnam and designated by the US as EOD Mobile Unit Pacific Team 35. Its responsibility widened to include part of the Mekong Dela. In addition, the team were able to access the US Navy Stores support system. Soon after the arrival of the fourth contingent in August 1968, arrangements were made to initiate a program of in-country exchanges of EOD personnel between the units. This exchange provided a much wider experience for the team as the nature of the task varied in each area. The teams were on call 24 hours for the entire length of their tours. To achieve this high rate of availability, most teams implemented an internal roster, which in any 24-hour period had two personnel ready at a moment's notice, two on standby as a backup, and two on stand down. Occasionally, four or five team members were deployed together on the one operation. Operations varied from bread and butter type diving and EOD operations to support of the Brown Water Navy. Divers worked alongside the US Navy SEAL, US Army, Air Force, Marine and Navy EOD, US Army Rangers, US Cavalry, Air and Armour and Australian Army training teams, US advisors and South Vietnamese Army and Navy units. In the early hours of 23 May 1969, a swimmer sapper attack against ships berthed at Tilong Pier in Vang Tau was thwarted, with the CDT-3 playing a major role in the incident, including the recovery of two modern Soviet BPM-2 limpet mines in mint condition. The swimmer sapper attack had been well planned. Fortunately, alert sentries during the middle watch of the swimmers and thwarted the attack of the two carrying limpet mines. One sapper had reached his target and secured a relatively large charge alongside the ammunition ship. Fortunately, it failed to detonate correctly, which if it had, would have resulted in a major disaster. In the event, two sappers were captured, but the sapper responsible for deploying the locally made charge managed to escape. The overall response to the attack showed that the established doctrine was sound and yet again showed how important alert sentries are. From late 1969, increasing EOD support for offensive operations became the higher priority task allocated to the team. Special operations were undertaken with the Vietnamese Armed Forces, clearing barriers along the approaches to enemy positions and allowing the Arvin the Army of Republic of Vietnam, or Special Forces to mount ambushes and reconnaissance patrols against known or suspected enemy-held areas. Altogether, the sixth team was involved in 22 offensive operations in the Delta, all conducted in areas held by the enemy and on most occasions involved in enemy fire of varying intensity. 
These operations intensified in 1970 and team members were often under enemy fire while engaged in the destruction of bunker complexes, tunnels, trenches, observation posts and log barricades erected by the VC in the rivers and waterways of South Vietnam. In June 1970, able seaman Bogdan Wodzik from the 7th Convention was fatally injured in a motor vehicle accident, the only fatal CD casualty of the war. In August 1970, after being relieved at Run Tower by South Vietnamese Navy personnel, the 7th team and their equipment were airlifted to the northern city of Da Nang in one corps, Military Region 1. With the move, the nature of the task changed. The first major task was the clearance of the Dong Ha ammunition storage area. Dong Ha is located in the province of Quang Tri, 24 kilometres south of what was then the demilitarised zone, which divided North and South Vietnam. A large logistics support base was set up to support US operations and included an ammunition storage area of 90 acres. In 1968, the base was attacked by the VC and North Vietnamese forces, which left a carpet of dangerous, unexploded ordnance covering the entire area. In March 1970, a special EOD unit was formed to clear the area. Personnel from the US Navy, Army, Air Force and Marines and members of CDT-3 participated. About 12 at any given time was all that could be spared. The clearance began on the 24th of March, 1970. The task was tedious and constantly dangerous. Much of the ordnance was partially buried and needed careful removal. Every few days, the unstable ammunition was trucked to a demolition range and destroyed under controlled conditions. Work under those conditions was limited to 30 minutes as concentration faded and a 10 minute rest period followed. Board Arvind troops would take pot shots at the AD teams from time to time despite threats of a most diabol diabol diabolical nature from the Marine officer in charge of the operation. Routine calls for assistance from ships in Da Nang Harbour and military authorities continued. But operations in support of US naval coastal groups increased. The team was employed on booby trap clearance for USN surveillance groups, which infiltrated into disputed areas by day and implanted sensitive acoustic sensors to monitor human movement at night. During the final months, much time was devoted to salvaging ammunition from stranded ships and in the ships themselves. Further enemy sapper activity in the Quaviat River resulted in City Team 3 support in keeping the river open. There were some 20 separate mining incidents with evidence of several other attempts to disrupt shipping. Two ammunition barges were damaged by limpet mines in addition to an MCM vessel sunk. City Team 3 recovered three pressure mines as well as two VC sappers killed by scare charges. In April 1971, C Team 3 was relieved of its responsibilities and the 8th Contingent departed Da Nang and left Saigon for Australia 5th of May. It was the end of CD involvement in the war. In all, eight CDT-3 contingents were deployed between February 67 and May 71, totaling eight officers and 41 sailors. Each team rotated through the war zone at approximately seven month in intervals. Over its four and a half years service in Vietnam, the eight teams searched 7,573 ships, removed 78 explosive devices from them, undertook 153 other major diving tasks, destroyed 353 tons of heavy ordnance and destroyed over 42,000 items of unsafe ammunition. Members also participated in 68 special operations. Thank you. 
Thanks, uh, Jake. Um, now, you commanded that last clearance diving team contingent. Um, what incidents stick in your mind? Yes, well, the first one, of course, was my first meeting with a real under, under unexploded bomb. It was a Mark 82 500-pound low-drag bomb with a bent fuse within 15 metres meters of a village and everybody looking at me like I was the expert. <laughs> The second incident, or the first incident really, was arriving in Saigon to be met by the US Naval Headquarters of MUPAC ensconced in a French villa and city bent on entertaining the American machine. Then two days later, to land at Da Nang with a burnt out C-130 at the air terminal, it had been rocketed the previous day. A flight over the demilitarized zone in a light aircraft circling the North Vietnamese flag and being shot by a lone sentry with an AK-47, courtesy of Lieutenant Ross Wood. Within the first week, members of my team being involved in a firefight where US personnel were lost. My first view of Republic of Korea troops on the move and their complete disdain of all around them. Our first main target which continued throughout our tenure, recovering unexploded throwouts from an ammunition barge that had been sabotaged in Da Nang Harbour by North Vietnamese forces. Trying to salvage another ammunition carrying landing craft on the beach at Tan Mai, or Tan Mi, which overturned in the surf during a tornado. The craft had been full of white phosphorus ammunition and our Army of the Republic of Vietnam security changed sides during the night. And we took fire every night from them while we were there. Operations on the Claviet River on the southern edge of the DMZ and watching the B-52 raids on North Vietnam. Every operation I was involved in sticks in my mind, and I do recall realising at a very early stage, the futility of the whole event. The heart of the coalition forces was not in it. The amount of booze and drugs freely available and a PX the size of Bunnings readily available. And lastly, leaving the Vietnamese people who had supported me to their faith. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jake. Um, to conclude this episode, I'd just like to ask the, the three of you for your uh, final thoughts on the clearance diving team um, in its uh, operations in the South Pacific and Vietnam in particular, but, um, but also just more generally about the evolution of uh, mine clearance diving. So, Heck, if I could ask you to do your yeah, comments yeah, first. Certainly. Off. In, in the 16 years of the development of the clearance diving branch covered today, We've seen how the RAN followed the Royal Navy initiative to introduce a full-time professional diver who was also able to undertake explosive ordnance disposal. The demonstrated professionalism of the clearance divers in their early years opened the eyes of the naval hierarchy and the operational clearance diving team was embraced by mainstream Navy. As Jake mentioned earlier, the introduction of then current US EOD concepts and techniques in 1964, although not realised at the time, was a major factor in updating and broadening the clearance diving capability. The fact that the RAN clearance divers had a common EOD capability to the US Navy meant that they were entirely acceptable to work alongside US Navy EAD units in Vietnam in 1967. By the late 1960s, the clearance divers' capability had matured and Australia was able to support our major ally in war in Vietnam, as just been described, and commenced the clearance, removal and destruction of the huge amounts of explosive remnants of war endangering populations in the islands, an activity which continues today. Both these operational activities were the turning point where the RAN moved forever from being a follow, follower of RN concepts and developed our own doctrine and capabilities 
relevant to our own environment. Uh, thanks, Heck. Um, Doug Moore, what are your thoughts? I'm sorry you caught me when I was looking up looking up the records. <laughs> <laughs> uh, having having heard about Vietnam and everything else, I, I feel that the, I, I feel that I've sold uh, the P, our P and G deployment short. Um, um, yes, um, and I really was looking at the time. Um, if I could recount one thing about CDs, we. You never ever, when you had a team of divers, a pair of divers, you worked them seven days a week. You didn't get them have any time off. They were they were they were red-blooded human beings, and they were apt to get themselves into little scraps and trouble wherever they went. I had could handle this. It's not a problem. Don't tell the authorities, and nothing will happen. And that's exactly how we worked the early part. Of the CD branches, we did. We we were looked upon by the by the rest of the fleet as pirates because we didn't we dressed we didn't use wear you want to wear your uniform. We didn't want to um, be on parade. We didn't want to do any of these things. <laughs> so we 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 lived the life of, of Riley. Actually, we were they left us alone. They loved anything that we did that would put. Uh, Credit to the RAN, but they uh, didn't want to know how we achieved it, and that's my my vision of the CD branch. Okay, thanks, Doug. Um, and finally, finally, Jake Linton, what's your thoughts? Well, just to uh, to add to what Doug has just said, anybody who's ever been responsible for clearance divers and what they do has usually spent about 99% of his time accepting accolades and 1% getting reamed out, I'd say, and the percentages are that way. I believe, I believe that in the 64 years since the introduction of the CD branch, it's evolved from a group of very fit, capable underwater workers to a cohesive unit of the RAN that has proved it can cover a vast area of responsibility from underwater worker through explosive technician and counter-terrorist operator to covert operator. This has come about initially by the lack of interest in the RAN in general in the early days. We were in the too hard basket. People didn't want to know what we were up to because it might reflect on them. And that allowed the branch to evolve without much guidance. It may do with the materials at hand to a large extent and continued with tasks such as you can be, there was where there was no fail-safe situation and got the job done. How many other specialist schools have employed a leading seaman instructor clearance diver as the instructor of a clearance diving officer's course? One of the most problem and not probably the key factors to the success of introducing clearance diving, was the use of Lieutenant Commander Morris Batterham as its guiding light. He was held in high esteem in Naval Office, in Navy Office, and was as well experienced as any man alive at the time in the field. In addition, he had a manner which imbued confidence in all that were in his purview, and he had uh, no peer still serving in the RAM. Clearance divers do the job because they love it, to the exclusion of just about all else. They are risk takers, not in the way that sounds, and improvisers who want to get the job done and are fiercely loyal to their comrades and proud beyond belief to be a clearance diver. And I wonder, uh, Admiral, whether you'd have been better prepared to serve in the Gulf had you known that about clearance divers. Thank you very much, Jake. I really uh, enjoyed uh, my experience with clearance diving team three in the Gulf. Uh, they're a great bunch, and uh, and I also knew they had the best barbecue <laughs> in, in that part of the, the world. Um, there you go. Uh, sadly, uh, that's all we have time for uh, in this episode. My thanks to Heck Donahue, Doug Moore, and Jake Linton. 
in the next episode, we will discuss the Ariane clearance diving teams in the Arabian Gulf, East Timor, some further operations in Southwest Pacific, and finally, Afghanistan. Thank you for joining us. And for more information on the Australian Naval History podcast series, simply search for Naval Studies Group in your search engine. Goodbye for now.